Okay, welcome back. And this is going to be your first cardiac, cardiovascular system lecture. And uh, most of it's taken from chapter 21 in your adult med surge book. So let's talk about the cardiovascular system. Okay, this is a very important piece of nursing uh, and of life, right? So um, one of the things that you need to understand is the anatomy of the heart. And that's the first thing that we're going to cover in this before we even get to pathophysiology. So let me share my screen and then let's get started. Okay. And here we go. So chapter 21, cardiovascular system function assessment, therapeutic measures. What are we going to learn? The normal anatomy of the cardiovascular system, how it functions when it's working right. So this way you can understand it when it's broken what kind of data we collect with these patients, what diagnostic tests you need to know about to diagnose disorders of the cardiac system, nursing care for patients undergoing certain diagnostic tests, therapeutic measures, pre-op and post-op care for patients that are gonna be having cardiovascular surgery. So let's talk about the heart, okay? Um, I'm gonna go to the picture because picture's worth a thousand words. So this is an anterior view of the heart and the outside of the heart. When you see pictures, you will see arteries depicted in red, and you will see veins depicted in blue. But fun fact, blood's always red. Okay. But the blue represents deoxygenated blood, and the red represents oxygenated blood. Okay. And on the outside of the heart, the outer layer, the myocardium, is a muscle, right? And so in order for muscles to work, they need oxygenated blood flow. So the coronary arteries are these guys that you see on the outside of the myocardium that feed oxygenated blood to that muscle. And that muscle makes the heart pump. Love dub, love dub, okay? When we look at a cross section from the front of the heart, now we're looking inside the heart, we've got another blood flow event going on. And this is your whole cardiovascular system, okay? So deoxygenated blood, comes from your feet, your hands, the farthest away from your trunk, travels through your veins, gets to the inferior and superior vena cava, which is the biggest vein in the body, and feeds into the right atrium. From the right atrium, it pumps through the tricuspid valve to the right ventricle. The right ventricle pumps that blood without oxygen in it to the lungs, and it goes through pulmonary arteries to the lungs, drops off carbon dioxide, picks up oxygen, goes through the pulmonary veins and feeds into the left atrium through the mitral valve to the left ventricle, which is the queen mother of all four of those chambers. And the left ventricle pumps through the aortic valve into the aorta, ascending and descending and feeds systemic circulation. In other words, that's what feeds oxygenated blood to your entire body, your organs, your skin, your brain, everything, okay? That's why the left ventricle, thickest walls, right? It's the most powerful because it needs womb power to push that blood through so that it gets everywhere that it needs to go, okay? So inside the heart, four chambers, right and left atrium, they're the top, right and left ventricle, they're the bottom. And then the cardiac layers, the epicardium, the myocardium, and the endocardium. So endo means inside and epi means outside. So the endocardium is the innermost layer, like a sac, which is covered by the muscle, the myocardium, which is then covered by the epicardium. And that's fed through the coronary arteries. And then of course we have the valves inside the heart that are one way doors, right? Remember everything in your body is basically South Philadelphia. Everything's a one way street. Nothing should ever move backwards. And those valves are kind of like one-way doors that open, let blood go through, boom, and then they slam shut. Okay? That's when they're working right. That's what they're supposed to do. So there's the blood flow that I just verbalized to you so that you can see it in words. Then we have an, a whole nother system going on simultaneously, which is an electrical system, and that's cardiac conduction. And so when we talk about cardiac conduction, on the exterior of the myocardium, there are areas called nodes that actually are like the ignition in your car. So when you turn the key, or now you push the button, the car vroom, starts up. Sinoatrial node, the SA node, 
It's called the pacemaker of the heart. That's at the very apex of so the top of the heart. And that's the one that keeps the heart rate at 60 to 100 beats per minute. Rum, lub dub, rum, lub dub, rum, lub dub. If something should happen and that fails, the atrioventricular or AV node is in the middle between the top atria and the bottom ventricles. That's why it's called the atrioventricular node. So if the SA node doesn't work right, the AV node can kick in, but its system can only keep the heart beating at 40 to 60 beats a minute. But that's not bad. Room, lub dub. Room, lub dub, right? Keep you alive. If that goes bad, you then have the bundle of his, which is at the bottom that has bundle branches right and left and then Purkinje fibers. If the top two nodes, the SA node and AV node fail, bundle of his can kick in. However, it's only gonna keep a rate of about 20 to 40 beats per minute. What's the problem you ask? Problem is when the heart is beating that slowly, it's not beating enough to pump enough oxygenated blood to perfuse the body, perfusion. So at 20 to 40 beats per minute, you're not conscious and you're barely alive if you're at 20 beats per minute, but you're alive, okay? And that's important to know. And here's a picture of the conduction pathway that shows the SA, AV, bundle of his Purkinje fibers, okay? Cardiac output, here's what you need to know. There is a number called the ejection fraction. And that's a test that we do. We do an echocardiogram, which is just an ultrasound of the heart. And we get this measurement of the amount of blood that's getting ejected from the left ventricle in a minute, right? A normal EF or ejection fraction is 55 to 70%. You will need to know that and you'll understand more about it when we get to heart failure, why that's so important. Okay. So this flow chart shows the regulation of the heart. Remember, you don't have to think about your heart beating. It just does, okay? And it's regulated by an intrinsic system that's involuntary, that's in your brain at the brain stem. See that little red area? Well, that's the thing that says beat and the myocardium, room, blub, dub. Beat, room, blub, dub right? It's going on constantly. Also regulates your blood pressure and helps to regulate um, your respiratory rate. Hormones. Why are these important? They are because epinephrine is a hormone that we all have, and it has to do with increasing the heart rate, increasing the, the contraction of the heart, right? Keeping things up, elevated. Aldosterone is another hormone and that works from the adrenal glands over the kidneys that regulate sodium and potassium. And remember, potassium, queen mother of all the electrolytes. It's ruled by aldosterone kind of indirectly. And then we have atrial natriuretic peptide, BNP, brain natriuretic peptide. This is a blood test that we can do. When we measure this BNP, it tells us if the patient's retaining fluid. Again, pertinent to heart failure. That's a lab you need to know. Normal, less than 100. BNP, okay? That's important for you to know. Blood vessels, you have arteries, veins, and capillaries, okay? Arteries carry blood away from the heart, blood with oxygen. Veins carry blood back to the heart. Veins have valves, arteries don't. And then capillaries are teeny tiny microscopic blood vessels where the veins and the arteries actually meet like in the tips of your fingers and your toes. Remember something, blood is always moving. If blood sits, blood clots, and that's called venous stasis. The word stasis or static means not moving. And your blood needs to be moving all the time, constantly. Okay. Here is the diagram that's a structure of the blood vessels. So you can kind of see what they look like. And arteries and veins are built kind of the same, except arteries, they're under pressure. So every time the heart goes lub dub, it pumps the blood, it's putting pressure through the arteries, right? So the walls of the arteries are thicker and arteries do not have valves in them because the heart is pumping blood and it's just got to go right through. Veins, on the other hand, not quite as tough as arteries and they have valves. Why? When your blood gets as far away from your body or from, from the core of your body that it can get like to your feet and to your fingers, 
it has to get back up and it comes back up through veins. Well, there's no pump. And so how does that work? Every time you walk or breathe or move, the muscles in your body are squeezing, contracting and relaxing all of your muscles. So every time your muscles contract, they squeeze the veins, which pushes the blood up through a valve, boom, and then the valve shuts. So the blood's here. Muscles contract again, ooh, pushes the blood up through a valve, boom, that valve shuts until it gets all the way back to the heart, okay? Blood pressure, we talk about this a lot. It's a measurement of the force of the blood against the walls of the arteries. Typical or average, I hate the word normal, blood pressure. Systolic should be somewhere around 120. Diastolic should be around 70, right? Um, used to be 140 over 80 was considered normal. The American Heart Association has lowered it and lowered it because more and more people suffer from hypertension and there are consequences. Hypertension is dangerous, it's the silent killer. Not gonna get into the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone mechanism just yet, but just understand that there's a whole system that goes on between your kidneys and your lungs and your heart that regulate fluid and fluid balance, right? So what happens when we get older? And you know, other people, not me. Aging does affect the cardiovascular system. I mean, it's just, it's a fact because parts start to wear out. And so, you know, what happens as we start to age? I'm going to make this a little bit bigger. So hopefully you guys can see it. Your conduction system, it's not working as effectively. And so older folks tend to wind up with dysrhythmias or a rhythm that's not normal. Dysrhythmia means a messed up rhythm. Your heart is supposed to have a normal or regular rhythm, kind of like a marching band, lubbed up, lubbed up. Lub dub, lub dub. If your heart rhythm is like a jazz band, lub dub, dub 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 dub, lub dub 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 dub, lub dub lub dub 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 dub. That's bad. That's irregular. And so irregularities are also known as dysrhythmias or arrhythmias, right? Not no rhythm. Arrhythmia means without rhythm. Dysrhythmia means messed up rhythm. Both of them are used oftentimes interchangeably. And so the bottom line is, is the rhythm is not regular, okay? And that happens with older folks. Atherosclerosis. Cook up bacon in a pan. Take the bacon out, let the grease sit in the pan. Go back 20 minutes later, the grease is hard. Atherosclerotic plaque is like that, but inside your arteries, okay? So what happens is over the years, that plaque can start to build up. So if you have an arterial wall or opening, lumen is what it's called, that's that big, and there's plaque built up inside, then it's now that big. And so the blood has trouble getting through. So people that are older are more likely to form clots because the blood's not moving the way it should. And there's decreased blood flow to the rest of the body because it's moving a little bit slower. Resting blood pressure will start to go up as people age, which can lead to stroke, can lead to heart failure. Um, heart rates can decrease with age. Older folks sometimes get very fatigued. And the valves inside the heart can start to get sticky or stiff, incompetent. They're not working right. And because of that, there can be problems with venous stasis in the legs, the valves of the veins, veins getting stuck, and then the valves of the heart not working right. So, which can cause a lot of problems. And we'll get into that. So again, aging, you know, atherosclerosis, which is that plaque inside the artery. Arteriosclerosis is a stiffening or hardening of the arteries that comes with age. Increased BP, vein valves are more incompetent, heart muscles not strong as it used to be, arrhythmias become common, right? All these things. And so cardiovascular disease is the number one cause of death in this country. And it used to be just men. Well, now we have caught up. Isn't that good news? Anyway, what can you do to avert cardiovascular disease? A healthy lifestyle, you know? Not, you are what you eat. I can't say that enough. So you need to eat right. Dietary fat needs to be reduced. You gotta stay away from the bad fats like that grease from the bacon, right? Exercise, you gotta sweat a few times a week. Stop smoking. 
Make sure that you're going checking blood pressure, your glucose levels, your cholesterol levels, and don't lead a sedentary lifestyle because that leads to obesity. Try to maintain a weight that is right for your body structure. All of those things can really help. Okay. Um, all right. Cardiovascular assessment. I'm going to do a health history, of course, physical assessment. And then we have some diagnostics to go over. The book with the what's up, they love that. But the bottom line is you're doing basically a full assessment of the patient. What are their allergies? Past medical history. What meds are they on? And including over the counters and herbals. What's their family history? And how do they live? Like, what are the, where do they work? Do they work in a coal mine? Obviously, that's not a healthy place to work. So, and what kinds of things do they do to try to keep themselves healthy? All of those are important questions that need to be asked. And then when you look at a patient, before you even speak, the minute that you eyeball the patient, what is their general appearance? Do they look healthy, right? Do they? Are they well-nourished or are they malnourished or obese, right? What's their skin look like? What's their color look like? You know, generally speaking, how do they look? What are their vital signs? Always, when you're doing an initial assessment, you get an orthostatic blood pressure. So in other words, you're getting a blood pressure when they're seated or supine, and then when they change position. So supine to seated, seated to standing. You're checking the blood pressure each time because if there's a drop of 10 millimeters of mercury or more with the change in position, that's orthostatic hypotension. And then of course the height and the weight, because that's important, right? And, you know, inspection, again, this all comes with observation. Oxygenation, what's their skin color? What do their extremities look like? Are their fingernails clubbed? What's their hair, skin, you know, you know look like? Does it look healthy? What about edema? Do they seem like they're retaining fluid? Are their ankles or feet or lower extremities swollen? Um, do they have any swelling in the face? swelling in the abdomen, right? Jugular vein distension. What's their cap refill, right? So when you are pushing on the capillary bed of the fingernail and it blanches and turns white, it should get pink again, three seconds or less, right? And then clubbing, which we talked about before in respiratory, but there is another view of what clubbing actually looks like, okay? Palpation, well, the point of maximum impulse. So in other words, that's the place where you put your stethoscope and you can hear the heart, the strongest, the loudest, the best, PMI, okay? These are some terms you need to know. Edema. Edema means excess fluid that's collected someplace it's not supposed to be, like subcutaneous tissue. Um, it could be peripheral, which means it's in your extremities. It could be ascites if it's in the abdominal cavity, or it's pulmonary edema if that fluid's collected in the lungs. And then of course you should be checking pulses, all of them, right? Because they give you a lot of information. What the pedal pulse feels like as far as its strength and its rate should be pretty damn close to what the rate is and the strength when you listen apically, okay? If there's a big difference, then there's a circulatory problem, right? Only makes sense. And we'll talk more about this. Um, this picture represents the point of maximum impulse. When we talk about the um, apex of the heart, remember, um, the apex of the heart is the pointiest part of the heart, believe it or not, right here. And that's the left ventricle, really, what you're listening to. So you're taking your stethoscope and you're going to the clavicle, the left midclavicular line, which is kind of in the middle of the left clavicle, and then you're counting the ribs and you're going down between the fifth and sixth intercostal spaces. So like one, two, three, four, five, six. So the point of maximum impulse is kind of in the middle, kind of to the left, okay? And you should always, no matter what, first time you're, you're assessing a patient, listen to the apical heartbeat for one full minute, one full minute, okay? Here's a diagram of all the pulses in the body. You need to know these. Need to know carotid, brachial, radial. Okay, um, you've got femoral, popliteal behind the knee, posterior tibial, which is behind the ankle, and then the dorsalis pedis, also known as the pedal pulse, which is on top of the foot. Okay, here's a picture of edema. 
pretty bad too. Look at that foot swollen. And this is a measurement of if edema is what we call pitting. Okay. Pitting means that when you push on the area that's swollen, it stays depressed, just like that picture, even after you remove your finger. And then the question is, how deep does it go and how long does it stay depressed? Okay. Which gives you a lot of information. Edema is either pitting. And if it's pitting, it's got a number attached to it. It's plus one. It's plus two. It's plus three. It's plus four pitting edema. If it's non-pitting, then there's no number attached to it, right? That means that it doesn't do that when you push it. It's non-pitting. Okay. When you're listening to the heart, you're listening for heart sounds. S subscript one, S subscript two, S subscript. Eight. So what you're listening to are heart sounds. S1, lub. S2, dub. And we'll talk later about what S3 and S4 can mean because they're not normal. Okay. Murmur. A murmur is the sound of turbulent blood flow. Okay. So if somebody says, I have a heart murmur, there's a bad valve, damage to one of the valves. And where you hear the murmur can also clue you in as to what valve is damaged. So, in other words, when you listen, do you hear lub dub, lub dub, or do you hear lub dub, lub dub? Or do you hear lub dub sh, lub dub sh? That sh, that's the turbulent blood flow. It's blood that's that's going backwards. And remember, not supposed to go backwards. Okay, that's a murmur. And then a pericardial friction rub. If there is fluid accumulated in the pericardial sac, right? Which just like a pleural effusion with the lungs. Here, you've got fluid or something that's accumulated in there. And when the heart beats, it's rubbing and you will hear a friction rub from the heart, okay? okay. This is your most basic EKG ever. I'm gonna try to make this short and sweet. When you look at a rhythm strip, what you see is a P wave, a QRS and a T. And that one right thing right there, that P, QRS, T is lub dub. Love dub, love dub. And we're gonna go into, when we get to arrhythmias, we're gonna talk about EKGs and what you do need to know as far as identifying EKGs. EKG is the same thing as ECG, electrocardiogram, okay? It's looking at the electrical activity of the heart. Um, usually 12 leads, but there can be a three or five lead for Holter monitoring or ambulatory monitoring or event monitoring. And we'll talk more about that when we get to arrhythmias, okay? We can do a chest X-ray if we're trying to diagnose something, we can do a CT scan. We can do an MRI, right? Or we can do an MRA, which is a magnetic resonance angiography or angiogram. That's where we're using contrast dye and we're looking at blood flow through arteries. We're looking for a problem with blood flow, with circulation, okay? Then we can do an echo cardiogram. And you're responsible, by the way, to know these diagnostic tests. They're pretty straightforward. Echocardiogram. It's an ultrasound, right? Ultrasound of the heart. And so it's recording the motion of the heart. It's looking at the structures of the heart, the valves. How big is it? What shape is it? Is it in the right position? And then that ejection fraction, which is important to know, 55 to 70%. Then there's something called a TEE. That's a transesophageal echocardiogram. That's where they take a scope and go through the esophagus and do an echo ultrasound from inside. And they're looking for something specific when they do that, okay? When they do a TEE, by the way, they're gonna have their throat with a local anesthetic and the probe goes in the esophagus. It gives them really good images. So they're looking for something specific if they do one of these. Um, and your job as the nurse, make sure you assess the swallow you know, until their gag reflex comes back. Anytime something goes down somebody's throat, after that procedure, you're always concerned about aspiration. Make sure that their gag reflex is intact. It's priority nursing intervention. We have an exercise stress test. It's called a treadmill stress test. Cardiac stress test all means the same thing. Put on some sneakers, comfortable shoes, take off your jewelry. I'm gonna put an EKG on you. I'm going to put a blood pressure cuff on you and a pulse oximeter on you. You're going to get on a treadmill 
and I'm going to look at your EKG and your vital signs before you start to move, as you start to walk, as you start to jog, and then when you run. Because when the heart is stressed, in other words, it's beating faster to keep up with activity or exercise, sometimes it does freaky things. That's what we're looking for. Okay. And that's kind of what it looks like, an exercise stress test. Tilt table test, don't worry so much about that. A Doppler ultrasound, we use Dopplers to find peripheral pulses. And we'll talk more about that later. Um, when you're identifying patients, remember, okay? You always need two ways to identify the patient. And, and as a whole, there are actually four ways. If you're gonna use the patient's name and date of birth, you need both of those things. What's your name and date of birth for that to be identification. You need their phone number, medical record number, and I'm gonna add in here, you could also use their photograph or a photo. And it's making sure that your patient's getting the right treatment, the right diagnostics, the right medications, all that stuff. Now, these are the blood work, the blood studies that you need to know, lab work. We're not gonna get into the cardiac biomarkers just yet, but you do need to know about lipids, fats. Triglycerides in the blood should be less than 100. Total cholesterol, less than 200. And then we have HDL and LDL, high density lipoprotein, H stands for healthy, low density lipoprotein, that's the bad cholesterol. And those numbers are more important than that total cholesterol. So total, yeah, it should be less than 200, but let's say the total is 240. But the HDL, the good cholesterol is 100 and the LDL is only 40, right? You want the HDL as high as possible, greater than 60. You want the LDL as low as possible, less than 100. And then that BNP we talked about before has to be less than 100, okay? all about fluid retention. Uh, let's see, cardiac catheterization, definitely something that you need to know about. Very, very, very important. What is it? This is gonna require a minute of explanation. Uh, I'm gonna pause for one second and come back. Okay, we're back. And we are gonna finish up with chapter 21, cardiac assessment. So let me share my screen again. And let's get back to this PowerPoint, which is, oops, that's not what I want. And that's certainly not what I want, but see, I clean up nice. All right, here we go. Chapter 21, we are um, at cardiac catheterization. That's where I left off. And that's where I'm going to resume. What is a cardiac cath or cardiac catheterization? It's a process where we are putting a um, catheter, which is a tube, a thin tube. We're inserting it usually into the femoral artery and feeding it up, 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 up to the heart. So we're looking for some kind of a problem with coronary arteries. This is usually the reason for a cardiac cath. Um, it's usually patients come into the ER complaining about angina, which is chest pain. And we will do an EKG and cardiac enzymes and other testing. And we're not really finding a reason. So we'll say, listen, we're gonna do a cardiac catheterization so we can look at the coronary arteries up close and personal and see, do you have plaque built up in there? It's depriving the myocardium of oxygen. Do you have a blood clot that somehow moved and lodged in there? Like what's going on? We need to look. And so the basics are that the patient is gonna be awake. They're not sedated for this. The room is loud and the room is cold. And there's a whole lot of equipment in the room. Must tell the patient that the table is gonna move. Because if they don't know about that in advance, lying on a table, the next thing you know, they start swinging and swaying. That can be scary. Um, table moves a lot. And the reason is, is that we start an IV and we infuse contrast dye. When the dye goes into the vein, starts to go through all the veins, patient's going to feel warm and flushed. And then moving that table helps move the dye through all the veins a little more quickly. Okay. And so we go in and we look. And depending on what we find, one of two things happens. Actually, one of three things happens. One, Nothing. 
because we don't find anything. Everything's fine. And we go, all right, you're good. Two, we find a problem with one or more of the coronary arteries, but it's not a horrible problem. It is a minor problem. So there's maybe a 30% blockage or 20% blockage in one of the coronary arteries. So we can go ahead and put in a stent and please don't call it stent. It's a stent. And what is a stent? It's a thin, um, looks like mesh tube that actually goes into the artery and opens it up to allow the blood to flow through more, more effectively. So that's the scenario two. Scenario three is you got troubles. You have a 70% blockage because there's so much plaque in there that you're not getting blood flow below that blockage. Well, now we're gonna schedule you for open heart surgery, which is also known as a coronary artery bypass graft. And we call it a cabbage. It has nothing to do with cabbage that you eat, okay? So those are the three outcomes of a cardiac cat. Either you're fine and there's nothing we found. You got a little problem. We put a stent or a couple of stents in. You got a big problem. You're gonna need open heart surgery, okay? Those are the three things. Now, after the cardiac cath, your job as the nurse, what do you have to do? Patient is going to have a sandbag or a couple of sandbags. That's what I said, sandbags at the site. So there's going to be gauze with a clear dressing over it. It's called an occlusive dressing and sandbag or sandbags over it so that they don't bleed to death. Because when we go into that femoral artery, it's a big artery, right? We want to make sure that they clot, right? So that, that we, they don't just bleed out, okay? And the patient has to stay supine. This is one of only two instances where we tell you, tell the patient, don't move. Don't move. The patient's going to remain supine about four hours after this procedure you know, not move that, that particular leg. Like they can move their upper body a little bit, but don't move that leg. We don't want them to bleed, okay? And then what's your job? What do you have to assess? Well, when we go into that femoral artery, that artery feeds that whole leg, oxygenated blood. Stuff can go wrong. So you must always assess the distal pulse. In other words, check the pedal pulse on the affected side capillary refill on the affected side, the temperature, the color of the affected side, and compare it to the unaffected side. So if they had this done on the left side, you assess the right foot, right foot feels warm, the left foot should feel warm too. The right foot is pink or you know normal for ethnicity, the left foot should be the same, right? All those things are important because if something goes wrong, we can actually cut off blood flow to the foot, anywhere below where we put that catheter in, right? So it's important to make sure that you're assessing this. And of course, vital signs, right? That's, that's almost understood, right? That's a real cath lab, just so people can kind of see what it looks like. And the, when the doctor is actually navigating the catheter, they're looking up at the screen and they can see inside the heart inside the myocardium, the coronary arteries, okay? And then therapeutic interventions in general, okay? There are risk factors for heart disease that are modifiable and non-modifiable. Modifiable means you can change them. Non-modifiable means it's the hand you were dealt and you're stuck with it, right? So if you exercise, if you don't smoke, if you have a healthy diet, you lose weight, right? If you do those things, and those are all modifiable things. In other words, if you don't ever get exercise, start, of course, speak to your doctor first, but start. If you smoke, quit. If you're not eating healthy or if you're overweight, lose weight, change your diet. Those are things that you can change to help yourself live a longer, healthier life. Now, what can you not change? Well, you can't change your genes. Right, so heredity is heredity. That's why we always ask about family history. Do you have a mother, a father, you know, sister, a brother with heart disease? Because that increases your risk. Not a guarantee that you'll get it, but it does increase your risk. Your age, you can't change that, right? And the older we get, of course, the more prone we are to things going wrong. Your gender, now you can kind of change it, 
sort of, but you can't change the fact that your DNA is always either male or female, right? So in other words, that's you, the gender that you have is written in your DNA and that's the gender that you have. All right, and then, you know, if you're under a lot of stress, support groups, ways to manage stress, because I will tell you this, stress will kill you. Everybody has stress, right? And there's good stress and there's bad stress. Getting a new job is a stressor. It's a good one, but it's still a stressor, right? The birth of a child, happy news, but a stressor. Divorce, usually happy news, but a stressor. <laughs> you know, money problems, not happy news, stressors. So we all have stress but it's how do you manage it? If you internalize stress and you keep it inside, then you're kind of like a simmering crock pot. And what's gonna happen at some point, it's gonna blow, right? Managing stress is important for all aspects of human health. Can't emphasize that enough, okay? And then what else can we do? Well, if we have somebody say that doesn't really lead an active lifestyle and they're you know at an age where they really can't, or maybe they have, physical limitations, anti-embolism devices like TEDS stockings, which are those real tight support hose, okay? They can help prevent blood clots, right? help with venous return. Intermittent pneumatic compression, also known as sequential compression devices or SCDs. These are kind of a uh, soft vinyl boot-like apparatus that gets wrapped around the patient's leg one for each lower extremity. And each of them has a tube coming from it that goes to a pump. And the pump will blow up those vinyl wraps with air. And they'll blow up with air. When they blow up with air, they squeeze the lower extremity to help the blood get up. And then they let the air out, they relax. They squeeze, they relax. They squeeze, they relax. So the SCDs are basically mimicking the movement of the muscles when the patient can't actually walk and help to return the venous blood back up to the heart. And then of course, oxygen, right? We always have oxygen. Um, there are lots of cardiac meds. So put your seatbelts on kids. You have antihypertensives, which include ACE inhibitors, um, that's angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors. You have ARBs, angiotensin II receptor blockers beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, aldosterone agonists, antiarrhythmics, cardiac glycosides like DIG. You have diuretics, loop diuretics, furosemide, bumetanide, thiazide diuretics, chlorthalidone and hydrochlorothiazide, potassium sparing, spironolactone, anticoagulants, warfarin, heparin, anoxaparin, antiplatelets, clopidogrel and aspirin, vasodilators, nitro, antihyperlipidemics like statins and niacin. So, but we're going to address them based on what they're used for a little at a time. And that is how we're going to get through this, okay? Together. So, um, and I did not get into the preparation for cardiac surgery. Um, we're going to talk more about cabbage, coronary artery bypass graft, also about valve replacement surgery in future chapters. So the cardiovascular system covers chapters 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, all right? But for this chapter, we're done. So I'm going to stop my sharing and I'm going to see you next time and stop the recording. Bye.